as a young Christian, you know, I, I was a Christian for several years before I even stepped foot in a church. And uh, when I got to college, I joined Campus Crusade, and Campus Crusade played a big role in my own development spiritually. However, in addition to what I learned at Campus Crusade meetings, um, uh, there were several books that I read that had a profound impact on me. Uh, one series was by Corey Ten Boom, uh, who wrote the, who's, who's the main character in The Hiding Place. Her books I found extremely helpful. Um, but Johnny Erickson, I don't talk about her a lot, but really she impacted me a whole lot in terms of really looking at spiritual maturity, she is probably one of the most mature individuals that I had any contact with. I might not actually have contact with her, but I read at that time all of her books. And the depth of, of understanding of, of what Christianity was all about came from her. I mean, she had a, she had a big impact on it. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Johnny Erickson, um, she was 17 years old when she jumped into the Chesapeake Bay and she misjudged how deep the water was. Her head hit the bottom and she fractured her neck between C4 and C5. Okay? As a result, she's paralyzed essentially from the neck down. She has a little bit of movement of her shoulder, <clears throat> but as far as fine motor movement of fingers and hands and anything below that, absolutely nothing. Okay? And uh, she had high hopes for herself. She went through severe depression. In fact, her first book was about the depression that she dealt with and the hopelessness. And then the second book was, it's called A Step Further, was about this topic of, of depression, about, about, about loss, about disability. What do you do when you face difficulty, when you face impossible odds? And I, she, was, I, she was very, very useful because, you know, I mean, here's somebody who has probably one of the worst things you can possibly imagine. What would you rather do, be blind or be paralyzed from the neck down? You know, would you rather be deaf or paralyzed from the neck down? That's a hard, that's a hard choice. Paralyzed from the neck down, that's a lot. That's very severe. Now, the thing is, when she was paralyzed, she was just a 17-year-old girl. She didn't have any gifts or abilities. She was an average student with no, spe with no, no, no specific talents to speak of. However, she did turn to God after hating God for a while. When she finally came around and surrendered to him, she surrendered to him completely. And, and, and basically, with God's help, her other gifts blossomed. Uh, she, her, her mind, well, she became uh, quite scholarly in terms of her studies and so forth. So she became a public speaker. Uh, she's very good at public speaking. Uh, her singing voice, actually, she was actually nominated for an Oscar uh, but then they pulled it back because they realized it was a religious work <laughs> before they realized what it was. So they rescinded the offer, but she was actually nominated for it for a movie that's coming up. But she has a really nice voice. Uh, she's an artist. She paints with her mouth. You know, I mean, so basically with the skills that she had, she trusted God. He blossomed those so that she has a rich, fulfilling life. Now, doesn't mean she doesn't have difficulties, and you're going to hear from her a little bit early on. But yeah, it would be very difficult to live that life because the amount of care that she requires just to stay alive is impressive. We have this idea that we would be better off dead than disabled. And I'm going to, I'm going to go into great detail about that today. And that is increasingly growing that, you know, I, I not only need everything I have right now, I'm going to need more. And to face a disability, to face the loss of a limb, the loss of a function of like eyesight or, 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 or hearing the, the, or, or dementia is absolutely terrifying. It's like, if I'm not making it now, how in the world am I going to make it with less and I'd be better off dead than disabled? Now, what happens when the government takes that perspective? Germany. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons before Obamacare, one of the reasons that medical professionals had a problem with the government getting too much involved in health care is that, is that before when you were paying for your insurance premiums, that was between you and your doctor and the insurance company, which was intrusive enough. But now you got the government as a middleman. And so you, if you get sick, you are a burden on the state. And you take it if you, and if you, the more you cheapen life and just wait, I think, wait one generation. And if you're going to be, because we don't have infinite money to spend on people. And uh, euthanasia has become more attractive. And there are governments already that have euthanasia in place. In fact, uh, one country, Belgium, 
You know, just last year, they approved not just euthanasia for grown-ups, they extended it to children last year. Okay? All right, this is, this is a clip from, anybody have Amazon Prime? Okay, you, you see the man in the high tower yet? That, that series they have? It's very good. It's, I, it was, okay, it was actually, I thought it was very well done. I, I, I liked it, actually. But it was based on the premise that what if the Nazis and the Japanese had won the Second World War? And so, that's, so basically it takes place in about 1960, 1961, and the Nazis, have, the Nazis and the Japanese have split the United States up to where you have uh, three quarters of the United States, you know, from the East Coast on over, is, belongs to Nazi Germany, and, and the West Coast states all belong to Japan. Okay, and in the middle where you have like Wyoming, nobody wants that, so they just call that the, the, the neutral zone because they say we don't want that. It's not, nobody lives there, so they just left left it open. But anyway, um, it shows what what life would be like if if the Nazis had taken over. And so this is just a, a short clip. Ah, egg salad. I hope that's okay. That's correct. There we go. That was your first long haul. How'd you know? Oh, not having a tool kit, that's a rookie mistake. Yeah, I guess so. It's my first time out of New York, actually. First time seeing the country. Oh, well, there it is. You mind to ask? Is that you on your own? Oh, soldier so fierce he'd kill a rose. That was you? Oh, a long time ago. We lost the war, didn't we? Now I can't even remember what we were fighting for. <laughs> uh, your dad of it? Yeah. Must be proud, fine young man like you. We're not really close, but me getting this job is pretty important to him. What is that? Oh, that's the hospital. The hospital? Yeah, Tuesdays, they burn cripples, they're terminally ill, drag on the state. There you go. You have a safe trip, son. Make your old man proud now. I doubt in the United States you're going to see something as barbaric as throwing people into crematoriums. You know, that's probably not going to happen. But in terms of um, the younger generation, their callousness toward the elders and toward the disabled is, is impressive, I must say. Um, their willingness to give up and terminate <laughs> is more than it used to be. I, I used to work in nursing homes, um, oh geez, about 15 years ago. And at that time, it was rare. You know, you see the family would come pretty regularly for a lot of people. There's always some people that don't get any visitors and so forth. But then occasionally you'd get the family come in and they, they, they were like, they couldn't wait for mom to die or they couldn't wait for dad to die. And it's like, don't you get, if they get sick of anything, if we gave them so much of the aspirin, they would be up there like, no, no care means no care. It's like, you know, they're not dying fast enough. As long as they're in this nursing home, they're eating up my inheritance. And they felt they had a right to their, and they were they were using it up, and that was the scary thing. Is the, the big, the, their biggest fear was that they would use up because they they'd sell, sell the family home, and their biggest fear was that that nursing home would eat eat it all up, and there'd be nothing left for them, as though they were entitled to it. And it's 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 like it's it's kind of shocking to look at that. It's like you have like no respect at all for your family. Well, that has gone up. You don't have if you don't have quality of life. It, you shouldn't be alive. You're wasting, you're, 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 it's a downer for the rest of us. We don't want to look at that. We don't want to look at that, yeah. Well, that's what this tall talk is about. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, exactly. You're right, you're right. It is not for nothing. And, and that, that, is, that is ultimately where I'm going with this, is that God created this cycle of life, and there is a role for us to play. And when we play our roles, we can be and are blessed in it. If there is no God, and, the, and we really are accidents or freaks of the universe, and there is no point to existence, then fine, death is as good as life. But that's not the way things are. Okay? But according to the world system, and, and that's what I've been saying, is when you get away from God, when you leave faith, you court death. Right? Now, some Christians, um, this idea that, that suffering is, is unacceptable, there are Christians that believe that. Uh, when I used to work down in Florida, the group that I hung with, um, they were into name it and claim it. And I was a young Christian at the time, and I didn't know 
any better. They could they quote in scripture, and so I'm like, wow, this is a whole new part of Christianity that I never saw before. I didn't know you could just name it and claim it. <laughs> I didn't know that God was cool with that, you know, because you look at the you look at the Bible and Jesus walked around healing people, right? They were blind, the lame, you know. He got this verse over in Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And they extend that to healed of everything. You got a cold, God will take care of that. You got a broken leg, God will fix it. You know, you got AIDS, herpes, whatever, God will handle that for you. You know, because if God, if God, if God, if God just as he forgave your sins, he also healed you from all iniquity, from all disease. And he can make it grow back. He can do all that. Now, the problem with that. And I remember getting into many arguments trying to explain that. Something doesn't sound, even though I was a young Christian, I was like, you know, this doesn't sound right to me. Something about this just seems kind of off, you know, because if that were the case, then you'd never get sick. And, and if you take it to its logical end, that means you would never die because every time you got sick, God would like automatically heal you. And like that would lead to eternal life on earth. And that's preposterous. But nope, they would go right back and point to those verses. Now, the problem there is that you know, if you have that attitude that, you know, no matter what my body is telling, I trust God to heal me and bless me with vibrant health and overflowing joy. Amen. Today on blessed.com, right? And it's like, well, it is okay to pray for healing. I am not saying, because God does heal. I am not saying that he doesn't. I've experienced it myself. Okay. Now, I haven't grown any limbs back or anything I'm going to call the news about. <laughs> but yeah, I think God does play a part in the healing process. And as we follow him, he does accelerate that for us. He protects us from diseases as well. But it's in his time. You know, when we pray according to his will, we leave that open to him. We don't demand that he heal us instantly or tomorrow. And some suffering is acceptable. Some suffering he uses to teach us stuff. All right? Suffering is a tool that is used by God quite often. We are not there yet. We're not in heaven yet. When we get to heaven, every tear will be wiped away and all disabilities will be gone and there will be no more suffering. Here, there is still suffering. Now, the problem with that idea that God is supposed, God is obligated to heal me of all of my infirmities is what if he doesn't? What if I don't get that white picket fence existence? with free of, free of challenges, free of diseases. What if one of my kids gets sick? What if I get sick? All right, uh, had a guy, we were talking about a guy a couple weeks ago who uh, used to have a restaurant and, and in his restaurant there were crosses all over the place and Christian sayings and uh, one, of, uh, one, of the, one of the women in our Bible study, she went back to his, his restaurant a little while later and it noticed all the crosses were gone. There were no more Christian sayings. And she goes, did, they, did you switch hands? What happened? Is, did, did the owner, did you get a new owner? He goes, nope, nope. He says, I used to be a Christian. I'm not a Christian anymore. Now I serve Satan. And I'm like, whoa, you, what, what? And apparently the guy was Catholic, okay. And he uh, got, his business wasn't doing really good. And he couldn't make, keep up with the payments on his house. And he prayed to God, God, you know, I don't want to lose my house. You know, that's so important. And he prayed and he gave money to the church and he said his prayers to Mary and all that stuff. And he lost the house. And he says, you know what? I'm not only am I not a believer anymore, I'm going to go as far away from God as I can. I'm going to serve Satan. And, that, and that's what he did. Okay. So, you know, it's like that's the thing is that if, if God is morally obligated to give us what we want, to heal us of our maladies and so forth, then what happens is that when God doesn't live up to his end of the bargain and something in our soul says that God is bad, then we are no longer obligated to live by Christian morality and we go darker, we go deeper into the darkness rather. Okay, and that's what happens. Now that's an extreme case, that's real. Somebody really did that, uh, which is like, well, I mean, I guess, um, it seems kind of goofy if you ask me. It's like, okay, are you saying you don't believe in God? You do believe in God, but now you've got to work for the... It's like, where do you think that goes exactly? It's like, think about it. You're going to serve Satan. So where, do you, where are you going with this? Do you think he's going to win? <laughs> I mean, if you believe in the biblical version of Satan, you know he doesn't win, right? If you, if you, read, the, you read the end of the book, he, he loses big time. Okay, do you, is, that, is that, you know, anyway. This is, this is Johnny Erickson, by the way, today. Okay, she's about, I think she's 65 or 64 right now. And um, so this is from um, a, a recent 
interview that was done with her. And so she's just discussing, uh, you know, what it takes and uh, what it takes to maintain every day. Another question that, again, I hope you don't find obnoxious or, or a little creepy, but, if, but as I'm here with you face to face, you look marvelous. You look fantastic. And if I didn't know better, I would have said, she spent all morning in front of a mirror getting herself ready. <laughs> You know, but I know that you cannot get yourself ready. At the risk of being creepy and obnoxious, um, how does that work? Warren, you, you hit the nail on the head for me of, of my fight to stay satisfied in God. Because every morning it is a challenge to get up. It is so hard. Living with quadriplegia and pushing 65 years old. Um, there are many times I wake up in the morning, my eyes are still closed. My head is on the pillow. I can hear my girlfriend in the kitchen running water for coffee. I know she's going to come into the bedroom in a moment, give me a bed bath, do my toileting routines, exercise my legs, strap on my corset, pull up my slacks, uh, put on my blouse, sling me into a wheelchair, push me to the bathroom, brush my teeth, brush my hair, blow my nose. I haven't even opened my eyes yet and I'm already exhausted. And I'm thinking, I have no strength for this. God, I am so tired of being a quadriplegic. I'm so tired of this. I have no ability to do this today. But I can do all things through you if you strengthen me. So would you please empower me today? Infuse within me today the grace needed to help me to open my eyes and face the day with a bright attitude, your attitude. And I tell you what, Warren, when I pray that way, and it happens almost every morning, by the time my girlfriend does come into the bedroom with that cup of coffee, I've got a smile sent straight from heaven. But it's been hard fought for between 7.30 in the morning and 7.35. And that's how I manage it. And I have learned that those points of desperate need of Jesus are where I grow the quickest. Um, the Bible says, sanctify yourself, set yourself apart. Well, I know in the morning before I wake up my eyes, I could choose to be complaining. I could choose to become demoralized. I could choose to think that I'm a burden on others, but I refuse to do that because God's word tells me the truth. And the truth is, every time that girlfriend of mine gets me up in the morning, she is enlarging her eternal estate. She is gaining a greater capacity for service and worship and joy in heaven. And, and she gets to experience that by helping me. So looking at life that way helps me be courageous about my own experience with a disability, that God can use me. Every time I ask for a drink of water, every time I ask for someone to empty my leg bag, they have a chance to serve and serve sacrificially, and that is helping them. So I tend to look at it that way, and that encourages me as I get up in the morning and face my afternoon and morning. Okay, that's really very insightful, because what she's saying here is that what allows her to go on and because it, seriously, that would be hard. It would be very hard for me to be dependent on people, to have to ask every time you want to drink water, I got to ask somebody. Every time my leg bag gets full, to, to change this, these stinky bags, okay, to, to, to give you a bath every day, to brush your teeth, comb your hair. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. It really is. It's absolutely, it's like she's got to be the bravest people I know because to face that, that's something that's absolutely terrifying. But that atti the attitude that she have is it, what she's what she's focusing on is true. She's focusing on the truth. If the Bible is real, if this really is God's word, then her view of the circumstance is real. Okay. When Einstein died and they dissected his brain, they didn't discover a greater number of neurons. I mean, he had a healthy number of neurons for a man his age, uh, but his brain wasn't shrunken. Like, a, like an old man's brain would be, somebody who was 80 years old, because but, but over time, if you don't use your brain, and with natural age, you lose brain cells, and the brain shrinks inside the skull, and you lose neurons. Well, his brain wasn't shrunken, though. It wasn't. Um, the glial cells had expanded in number. Normally, each neuron has somewhere between five and nine glial cells that support it. The glial cells are the helper cells. They're the ones that bring in the nutrients and take away the waste products. Okay, now in the brain, the stars are the neurons because the neurons are doing all the heavy lifting. They're doing all the work. But without the glial cells, the neurons would die in a fraction of their normal lifespan. 
the glial cells allow the neurons to carry out their function so that your brain will work. Those helper cells, even though they have a shorter lifespan and they're not the stars, they contribute to your brain every bit as much as the neurons do. Okay? She has that view of the Christian life. Those people that help her, that girlfriend of hers and her husband, when she sings, you know, her husband has to be behind her, so when she has to raise her voice, he has to squeeze her chest so she can get it out. All right? So when, she's, when you hear her singing these songs, imagine it's not just her. Her husband is there squeezing her so that when she can raise her voice because her diaphragm isn't strong enough to kick, out the, to kick it out. Okay? But those people that help her, she's, the way she thinks of it is this. When you help somebody who can't help themselves, God will bless you for it. Okay? You are, you are where God wants you to be. And when you get to heaven, the reward that you get is not going to be that much smaller than hers. They are taking part in the same ministry, running alongside. And I love this because this worldview is very important because so often we think that in order to really be gifted in, in the Christian life, you need to be a public speaker, you need to be able to be very persuasive, you need to look good, be smart, be talented, have, to, to, to be, have some type of artistic ability so that people are attracted to you. And taken, taken together, if you look at it as a body, it's like, Anybody can be where God wants them to be. If even, even it's, it's something, Jesus said, if you, whatever you do, if you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Giving somebody water in his name is something that God honors. And no matter how much we lose, no matter what disabilities we face, there is still opportunity. I mean, God is, he's, he's, he, ultimately, the only opinion of us that matters is God's opinion. And ultimately, what is most important in life is fulfillment. And who is in charge of my fulfillment? Am I in control of my fulfillment? I mean, can, can I make sure that I have enough love and belonging and purpose and freedom and, 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 and fun? You know, can I, can I ensure that? No, I'm not in control. I sometimes think I am when things are going my way, but I didn't do it. I didn't stop myself from getting Lyme disease. I didn't stop myself from getting uh, you know, some tick-borne virus or some other disorder. I mean, I've been, I've been exposed to a whole lot of things that I didn't get. I didn't stop that, God did. And he has allowed us to have the gifts that we have right now, but also the, th the things that do get us, he gives us the strength to bear. And he says, you know what? No matter what, my grace is enough and I can, I can, you can still achieve fulfillment even in the midst of this. And here's a great example of someone who has lost everything that you think were, that makes life worth living. And God, and, and she trusted him, and God has still given her not just a, a fulfilling life, but an abundant life, you know, with, with challenges as well. Now, been a very long life for a quadruple. What's that? Yes, yes, for a quadriplegic, you're absolutely right, absolutely, yeah. And it also goes to show you, I mean, stress hormones, I mean, I, I could give you an hour lecture on stress hormones. I mean, if you, if you perceive your situation as unacceptable, if you choose to adopt a depressing worldview, ultimately it will accelerate the aging process and kill you. Stress hormones do kill. They shorten your life. In fact, they literally, they literally shorten your fuse. I talked about this several years ago, but you might remember. Remember I talked about telomeric DNA? The, remember what telomeres are? The DNA on the ends of your chromosomes, okay? As you get older, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. That's why if you take a look at the DNA, at your DNA at 50, you find the telomeres are several base pairs shorter than they were when you were 30. And it's like your lifeline. That's the ability that, that, that they maintain the integrity of your genetic material. And again, yeah, yeah, and so basically it helps, they help, they help maintain integrity through DNA replication. And so it gets shorter with age. And what they did was they measured telomere length in mothers who were taking care of disabled children. And they, mothers were given questionnaires to see how stressed they were. Well, the mothers that had the highest amount of stress, these were the ones that hated the fact that they got stuck with the disabled child. They didn't like all the care they had to give. They felt they, felt they were cheated. They felt that it wasn't fair that other women had normal children and they got stuck with these children with problems, okay? And they, and, and they, were, they, were, they had anxiety and depression related to the care because they, 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 felt, they felt, you know, what choice do I have? I had this kid with a disability and now I'm stuck with him for life and that was their attitude. 
And then you had mothers who took care of these kids. They had a cheerful heart. They, they still had full lives. They, they, did, they did other things, but it didn't bother them. And they looked at their telomeric DNA after five years. And the women that, that did the complaint, the women that, that were stressed out, their telomeric DNA, they lost about 15 years during that five-year period. That's how much stress it, it shortened their, their telomeric DNA by the equivalent of 15 years. Okay? Stress shortens your life. Yeah. When we face extraordinary stressors, the level, in order for us to maintain, in order for us to persevere and experience a fulfilling life, we have to step our faith up. The old level of faith that we used to have is no longer good enough. It's not strong enough. You need to, you, we need to move into superhuman levels. We need a level of dependence on God that was not there before if we're going to maintain. That's one of the reasons that he allows this stuff in our lives. We are forced either, the, the bottom line is we're forced with a choice. Either you step it up and trust God more and give him these problems and make a total commitment to him and trust him and you keep trusting him on a daily basis. Either you do that or you wallow in your loss. You wallow in your hopelessness. You wallow in your despair. Those are your options. You know, and, and part of us, when we get put in that situation, part of us resents the fact that we're in that situation because those are your choices. There is no other option. What's the most scary thing about facing our current disabilities or about future disabilities? Hearing, for example, that, oh, guess what? There's Huntington's in your family and you've got the gene. You're going to be demented and crazy in five years. You know, what do you do when you're facing something like that? It's very scary. Why is it so scary? Why is it so scary? Well, your flesh has these neurotic needs. Your flesh will always have these neurotic needs as long as you're on earth. The neurotic need to be perfect now. I don't want anybody seeing my, 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 my bad stuff. I don't want anybody seeing my imperfections. Why? Well, if you see that, you're not going to give me the respect that I need. Okay, so you can't see any imperfection. Okay? The neurotic need to be loved by everybody. How do you know you have that neurotic need? How do you feel when somebody disapproves, when somebody frowns, when somebody makes a joke about, joke about you? Okay. Uh, sometimes people with severe depression or long-term physical illness that leads to depression, as they start going down the dark path, they become increasingly paranoid. And I've seen it happen to many people. Okay? They become an ugly shell of the person they used to be. They become paranoid, they become suspicious of everybody. You look nice today. So what about yesterday, you didn't say anything. You didn't, you didn't say anything. I looked bad yesterday then, right? Okay, yeah, that's why you tell me this now. Everything is taken in the most negative fashion possible. And they're difficult to deal with. You know, that's, a, that's that neurotic need to be loved by everybody. You know, I have to have complete acceptance by everybody or else I'm gonna have a really bad day. And then the neurotic need to be in control. Now. When you're facing a disability, I mean, if you don't have control now, think about how much less control you're going to have with the disability. See there? If, there is, if, you're, if we are, have any hope of maintaining the delusion of control, a disability pulls that out completely. So there is no longer any hope, any threat of hope of being in control. Truth of the matter is you never were in control, ever. But disability makes it clear that you never will be. Now, 1 Timothy, uh, Paul's talking to Timothy here, and it talks about the need for control, basically. And how do, what's the number one means by which we try to achieve control? It's through wealth, okay? And there are people that use Christianity or use religion to get wealthy, because the bottom line is that if, if religion is supposed to make me happy, what makes me happy? Money makes me happy. Control makes me happy. So how can I use this? How can I use you people to make money? And I tell you, if you've been in church any length of time, you know there are always people like that who show up, and the next thing you know, they want to sell you something, you know, because they want to, you know, how can I find a bunch of people? If I can sell a bunch of this stuff and make you work for me, then that's a way of making money. So anyway, uh, this is addressed here in 1 Timothy. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. 
Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can take nothing with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall in temptation are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Perseverance involves enduring hardship. It involves taking whatever disability comes our way and, and, and hanging on to the Lord in the midst of that, trusting him to help us through that, trusting him for the grace to get us by without saying, you know what, God, you didn't live up to your end of the bargain. So I'm looking for a way out. I'm not, the first thing you want to drop is the Christian morality because you need all the pleasure you can get, right? You know, so I mean, that's, that's that, that thing. So, you know, you kind of, you, you, see, you see the two put juxtaposed here in this passage. The, 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 the Christian who basically wants to look good they want to use, their, use Christianity to somehow get power, to, to, to get control. Wealth is the most important thing. And he says, if that's the most important thing, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be pierced with many sorrows because God's not going to be cool with that. Okay? That's not going to, that's not going to be okay. So be content in all things. Now, and then in 2 Corinthians 12, you know, this is, remember when Paul uh, got a, had a near-death experience? And he got caught up into heaven and saw things that, that he couldn't talk about. And he says, you know, he's talking about, he's, 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 he's not bragging, but the Corinthians were minimizing his importance. And he says, you know, I'm not going to brag, but I knew a guy <laughs> who had this experience, you know. And so he's kind of in a backhanded way saying, look, I've actually seen heaven, okay? It's like, uh, but I'm not going to brag about it. In fact, I could have gotten a big head about this experience, but when I got back, God gave me this thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know what it is. We don't know if it was his eyesight failing him. There's some evidence that might have been or some other physical ailment. But he was given some physical ailment after this experience. He says, he says, because of the extravagance of those revelations and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough, it's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. Now, I take limitations in stride and with good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. When I am weak, then am I strong. And so again, it goes back to this, this subject of handicaps, of disabilities. We're going to pick them up. Now, some of them are temporary, some of them not so temporary. But whatever it is, if a, a physical thing is taken away from us, if, a, if something that makes life worth living is taken away, God will use that weakness or can use that weakness to make us stronger. Okay? And, that was Johnny, and that's what Johnny Erickson, I think her life is an example of that. Now, I mentioned earlier that in Bel Belgium's been in the news lately because ISIS is uh, you know, making that a, a target city, um, but or a target place. Um, they, last year, they made the news because they were the first country to euthanize children. Okay, so now they've made it so that if you have a child with a disability and the parents want to, you can now legally euthanize your child under 12. So this is the first country uh, to do this. 
Um, and what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that idea? Yeah, well, that, that, that's, uh, that's definitely true. <laughs> You're right there. You're right there. It's not up to you to take the life of somebody. No, no, it, nor should it be. Nor should it be up to a child. Can you imagine? You know, going to your child and say, well, honey, I know you're, in, you're, in, you're not comfortable and you're in pain and the doctors can't do anything for you. So if you want, you know, we have a way to make you go to sleep and not wake up, you know. And the government, you know, um, you're less than 18, so the government prohibits you from alcohol and pornography and cigarettes and so forth. But they will allow you to get three, three grams of phenobarbital <laughs> if you want, you know. Now, children, especially adolescents, I mean, seriously, okay, think about it. We live in a, de a pro-death culture. If I can't get my way, life's not worth living. As we're going through, I mean, the generations that exist now, they are becoming more and more of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. This pro-death thing is expanding and expanding. You know, you start making euthanasia available to adolescents, they're already killing themselves in record levels. Okay, this is going someplace pretty scary. Okay, and basically this is what you get with a, a demoralized, faithless world. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, a thief is only there to, to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. You know, I came that you might have life and have it in the abundance, a fulfilling life. That's what he offers. If I believe that, then no disability can take that away from you. Okay, somehow he can do that. And what euthanasia does is says, you know what, it's nothing, it's over. It's over. You lost your leg, man. You know, you lost your leg, you're half a person now. You're not possibly going to have a fulfilling life with only one leg. Just kill yourself. Here we're looking at the uh, children, and this is something that we see in practice all the time now. It's like the, it, the, the incidence of major depression in kids has gone up, especially girls. This is a really toxic place for little girls. Now, 16.2%, this was from 2013, 16.2% of the women, of the girls today have major, meet, meet idea for major depression disorder. And they're all thinking about suicide, by the way. 16, they're, they're thinking about this is with suicide. This is with suicide thoughts. All right? Now, how does that compare? In 1965, it was 2%. To put things into perspective, it's gone up 800%. Okay? From 2% to 16%. Attempted suicide rate for high school students in the last three years went from 6.3 to 7.8, almost 8% have, have attempted suicide. Almost 8%. And you want to give them the decision as to whether they want to, you know, well, you've got depression, you failed on a couple of antidepressants, just kill yourself. It's your choice. What, do, you, what, do you want to die, honey? You know? And there are parents that would help their children, I'm afraid, <laughs> because from what I've seen, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we are tired of these problems of yours. Why don't you think about that? All right, it's just going up. Look at the slope of the line. I mean, the, the lines are going up. They're going up. And if you take a look at, you know, where, where as a culture, where we're going, I mean, I mean, the most popular tattoos out there. I mean, seriously, are, are, do, are anybody surprised by these tattoos? Who hasn't seen these tattoos? Come on. Who, I mean, these are the most popular. It's, it's like, why? Why are we glorifying death? Now, one nice thing, fortunately, with the obesity epidemic, we have more room to write, and so you can put nice, <laughs> you can have bigger tattoos, you know. <laughs> so, so I mean, come on, you know, it's like you can't, you can't, you can't get such big tattoos unless you've got a good canvas, right? Now, the thing is, is that why, think about it. Why? Why are skulls? I mean, you're putting skulls and flowers together. That spells funeral, right? You know. Why are you so excited about death? They don't even know why. They don't know why. They just, and you listen to the music and everything, and it's like, I never, I never would have predicted that we would evolve in this direction, you know, where, where, I mean, over, I mean, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, they accused rock and roll people of, of backwards masking, of putting satanic messages. Now they don't need, they just come out and say it. They just, nowadays, it's like whatever, whatever they mask is nothing compared to what they actually say now. All right. All right. Thing is, 
is that with, with disability, with loss, pain, and so forth, you know, we serve a God that can, he's a way maker. And when we don't see any way out, when we don't see any way we could possibly experience fulfillment, God can come through, and he does come through. Those that trust in him find a way. With Johnny Erickson, she was a 17-year-old kid that had no special gifts, and he took everything that she had left and expanded it, and he gave her a rich, fulfilling life in spite of the most, one of the most severe handicaps that a person can have. Okay, and I, I, I think that you know, and I think with 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 Corey Ten Boom, you know, she lost her whole family. Everybody was exterminated in the Holocaust. She came out. Imagine your entire family killed by the Nazis, and she starts a ministry of forgiveness and affects ultimately thousands of people before she dies, maybe millions. Okay, God can take our losses when we are weak. He can make us strong because of who He is. And a faithless world says, nope, there's no hope. You know, if, you don't, if, you're not, if you're not the full person you used to be, then life's not worth living and you may as well just die. That is the enemy. He says he's there to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he uses opportunity, he uses despair to carry out his plan. And he's doing that. You know, our job is to spread hope. You know, the people that we know, I mean, when we share Christ with people, we are, we are, we're spreading life. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's the, it's, we have the most important message that there is. And if we can affect even one person, you don't know who, that per, who, who they're going to affect. But ultimately, you know, we live in a world that's dangerous. People do get diseases, bad things happen. But even in the midst of loss and pain and disability, God does help. He does bring hope. He does bring healing in his time. But before the healing comes, he can still do great things. Okay? He can actually use our weakness to make us stronger. All right? And that is anti-death. That's about as anti-death as you can get. And that's why we are pro-life. God is pro-life because there's hope. If there were no hope, then pro-life would be a meaningless thing. If we just crawl out of a swamp accidentally, then you know what? Pro-life, pro-death, it doesn't matter. We're all going to the same oblivion anyway. It doesn't matter if you go there sooner or later. But that's not the, that's not the truth of it, though. Okay. All right, any questions?